Hi, everyone. Welcome to the death of hardware knowledge. So, before we get into who, who we are, uh, we are two long-term time friends. I've known Jay for at least 15 years. And you're kind of getting an insight into some conversations that we've had and about technology in the future and concerns that, that we're starting to see and see echoed in, in our technology communities. So, I'm Julia Krieger. I'm a senior principal software engineer at Red Hat. I'm also the, the chair of the board at the Open Infrastructure Foundation. And I'm the former leader of the Ironic Project. And uh, I'm Jay Faulkner. I'm the current Ironic Project team leader. And I am the OpenStack technical, I'm on the OpenStack technical committee. No. So uh, why are we here? This is, this is kind of interesting because the reason we're, we're co-speaking about this is it sort of sprung up organically but, um, with each of us separately and we figured out that we were completely aligned on this. She was, uh, she was telling me a story, uh, telling me a story, you know, the type of stories you tell with your friends when you're upset about something. So about a company that made the decision to go use the cloud simply because they didn't have knowledge about how to operate hardware. They didn't have the employees, they didn't have the training to know how to use hardware, so their decision was made for them. And, and to me, that seems crazy. As someone who's, who's spent my career working on hardware and automation, hardware's timeless. No matter what you do, you're gonna have a piece of hardware there behind it doing it, whether you have to think about it, someone else is thinking about it, or, or maybe no one at all. Um, and so like, we're not here to say go one route or go the other. We wanna give you the power to make good informed decisions about cloud. And, and sort of getting onto that, what are we not here for? Well, we've been working on cloud software in OpenStack for, for a decade. And so the impact of that cloud technology is completely beyond question. And, and if you want to hear all the great stuff about cloud computing, there's a large number of great talks on the internet at other places in scale. We're not going to talk about that. You probably use the cloud. We're under the assumption it's the default position and that you probably understand how it makes you faster. So we might breeze over that stuff. Please don't take it as a negative. We're talking about stuff that's missing. So that doesn't mean we, we don't know that the stuff's there. So uh, this is not us. <laughs> We're not gonna be yelling at the cloud at all. So we know about this and, and we sort of think about this because this is what we do. We're bare metal cloud developers. We automate bare metal and provision and, and make it easy. We do this as part of the Ironic project, which provides bare metal as a service. You can learn more at ironicbaremetal.org. But this is not an ironic talk. Well, it, it is an ironic talk, kind of. Um, so early on in ironic, uh, I had an intern working with me at Rackspace in the, in the early days of Ironic, and we kept trying to explain to them the bigger picture of how Ironic and how cloud worked, and we were talking about pixie booting and BMCs and hardware and firmware security, and he wrote this, where um, he was telling us about how it's magic, and, and we got this, this is a great hoot, we've got t-shirts printed with this, we've had stick, we, we put it in our, in our, in our talks, right? So this is, this is kind of an ironic talk because when we talk about the death of hardware knowledge, that uh, maybe, maybe we had something to do with that. Ah, <laughs> so we're starting to see a trend. Where the lower layers we have, we have built newer layers of tech technology upon are less understood. creating a technology fog of war. Clouds are almost by definition abstract in details. You can't, you, so you can focus on other more related things to what you're doing, whether it be the application you're developing or the, the style of workload or, or really whatever. You don't have to necessarily think about all the underlying details. Unfortunately, this approach also has many pitfalls. 
And this is where we get back to this, and that maybe it's our fault. Um, we're, we're kind of professional fog machines. If there's a technology fog of war, um, we kind of did it a little bit here. Um, you know, our, our careers, a large portion of it, have been dedicated to providing automation, to providing better interfaces, to make it so that people can make this hardware appear in, in, in literally minutes or less. And uh, organizations of all shapes and sizes have used the code that we've written and worked on to automate away lots of their hardware problems and maybe some of their hardware knowledge, which today, as opposed to 10 years ago, is concentrated more in people like Julia and I who focus on hardware as our primary job. And so that, that concentration is sort of what we're talking about. But, you know, we contributed to it. It's not all our fault, though. We're not the only ones. If, uh, if you're entering technology today, you know, most of the interns, most of the new employees I've worked with fresh out of college, they, they haven't had the same hands-on experience that someone might have had uh, who's more experienced, hands-on with hardware working on it. And so, you know, your first foray into, you know, professional Linux or open source might actually be a cloud account that you've skipped over all the hardware steps and you're going straight to calling an API receiving your server, and getting all the magic that we promised. And so that's, that's sort of, hardware's turning into a specialty, but like most specialties, you can't get away with knowing nothing about it. Um, and this, hardware's an afterthought to most modern developers. If you're thinking about hardware, you probably wish you weren't in today, because your boss doesn't care about hardware. Your boss cares about your web app working or about you being able to run your, your science jobs on, thing, on your clouds. And, uh, and so I, I kind of lucked out a little less than a week ago. I saw this nice thing posted on LinkedIn. The gentleman was nice enough to give me permission to put it here. And uh, this was posted in context of what you might want to learn as someone who is in school or, or getting out of school and trying to get a new job as a back-end developer and sort of what, picking the technologies you use to build your burger. But uh, there's, there's no plate there. there. There's no table. Where's the farm? Where's the road that got the food from the farm to the cheeseburger? Those aren't even on there. If you look, you know, the closest thing to harbor they have in here, they start at containers. The top of the bun is the containers. So whole layers have been cut this out. And we even build this bias into how we talk about jobs. How many of you have seen full stack developer positions where the bottom of the stack is a simple backend web service? That it doesn't go into the infrastructure, it doesn't go into the hardware, that you know, even in our industry, many companies have taken their nomenclature and turned it into something where you know, you're just chopping out the bottom of the stack. So it's important to think about what, what we've left behind and what we're giving up as we make this transition. Because this is a good transition. Using cloud enables lots of great stuff, but, but we're leaving some stuff behind. And, and this sort of leads me to, to go back to when I was first interacting with Linux. You know, you're talking 20 plus years ago, and I wanted to install Linux. So what did you do if you wanted to install Linux, you know, back in, back in the early 2000s? You went, and you went to your local Linux user group. You went to an install fest. And the first conversation they had to you was about what hardware you were bringing, because the hardware inherently mattered at that stage in time. You couldn't just take it for granted in the same way that you do today. And so whereas there used to be that, that barrier of entry you had to clear of knowing something about hardware, having a passing familiarity with the terms, thinking about the different pieces of the systems, you know, you weren't running Linux, you weren't running BSD, you weren't running most um, open source operating systems at that point, if you didn't have physical hardware. Years ago, I was working in litigation systems on the technology side, setting up building data centers, housing millions upon millions upon millions of single page TIFF images, which were documents. We were basically doing cloud before there was cloud. We had farms of NASs, SANS all over the place. And that time was really painful, and as we abstracted things away, it became easier. But every time we did, we were making trade-offs. We found we hit performance issues in one place, but we saved in other places that were more acceptable. And to really go back to the, what the question of what we have left behind, we must recognize the trade-offs we have made. 
at each and every level of abstraction. Now, these trade-offs do impact your business, whether it's, well, sorry. These trade-offs do impact your business because vendors are seeking to monetize a lack of knowledge. And they're doing this through service offerings. And this is not necessarily a bad thing. You have like a chaotic neutral stance that could exist, where in the olden days, you could have repaired a machine in four minutes, or maybe, maybe at worst, 40 minutes. Whereas now you might have to wait a minimum of four hours to have replacement parts. In most businesses, this comes down to a business decision of how the business wants to be run, whether it's driven by CapEx or by OpEx uh, preferences. Ultimately, this is all a good thing. We have less in our brains. I don't have to necessarily think about which pin is one. I don't have to now. <laughs> and it's even better because we have the freedom to abstract our problems away, which is great for our industry. It's great for the evolution of technology. It's great for our velocity. So like, the, the trade-offs are impacting your technology too and impact sort of the decisions and the range you can make those decisions in. So you might experience a loss of flexibility where instead of having the full slate of options of hardware configurations, of technology stacks, of, of software available to you, you might be looking at a curated menu of things that a vendor's providing for you or of uh, trade-offs that are made by the technology you pick to implement. It can, it can kind of hide some hidden risks in your system. You might not know exactly what software is running or where to enable your code. You might be relying on some random person in Nebraska to keep your cloud running without even knowing it. And especially in a world today where, you know, you might have people on the business or legal side looking for a software bill of materials, that sort of fog of war may not be appropriate in your business at that point. Um, and, and and lock-in's a, a thing, and I think, you know, this is a, a conference about Linux. This is about open source. Lock-in is something we talk about and we think about a lot in context of vendors. But lock-in is a technology artifact as well. And we'll talk about that some where you can lock yourself into a specific technology or way of thinking simply by the amount of time you've invested learning and implementing that technology. Um, and, you know, getting... Getting more to specifics, it can be really difficult to reason about the performance of your, ser of your servers and your applications because the further you get away from the hardware, the more that performance is going to vary and the more difficult it's going to be to nail down your specific bottlenecks. So what we're going to do is we're going to sort of start at the bottom of the stack and we're going to walk our way up and talk a little bit about what trade-offs you might be making at each abstraction layer, whether you realize it or not. So, for example, you may have your own hardware in your own data center, and you may be looking at a managed hosting provider, which may be someplace else. It may be in the next state. It might, might be on their side of the world. Who knows? You probably have made a decision that's explicit in where, but you may not control all the details. So, if your data is local, it's a local universe. You have all your data there. You have gravity in that data. And that gravity creates its own lock-in. But as you move data off-site, you have to deal with data being in more than one location. You have to deal with the fact that there's a latency to get that data and to interact with it. And at some point, you lose specific control over hardware. What, what is in the chassis, you might not really know or be able to deal with that. And maybe your business is OK with that, or maybe you need to have a very specific card. It's really going to depend on what you're doing and why. But ultimately, the amount of data you have and your access pattern is a huge consideration you must be conscious of. When you look at operators that tend to run, still run their huge own data centers, their, t their primary concerns tend to be latency and security. And that way, they're in direct control. They can directly measure and account for every aspect. And they can reproduce their experiments or ensure that no one's touching that data. 
that is not authorized because that data might be behind a fence with armed guards. Who knows? But, you know, whether or not your servers are on site or hosted in someone else's rack, most people aren't dealing with hardware on a server-by-server -server basis anymore. We've got abstractions on top of that. And one of the more common ones is, is virtual machines. And, uh, and there, there are some pretty significant trade-offs here. Um, like I said before, you lose that precise understanding of your capacity or your performance. Um, plus, you have to deal with the variability of noisy neighbors. And I have a, have a kind of fun story about that. Uh, at one place I worked, um, they had implemented this great system for auto-scaling their services inside a cloud. And it worked great, but they had this problem of that one every so often times, like a dice roll, they would roll a one they would get the worst virtual machine possible. You could see it in their graphs. You could see it in their customer response times. It had a significant impact on their ability to run their infrastructure efficiently. And so they developed an entire benchmark suite that would run before they even provisioned their workload onto the new cloud virtual machine in order to make sure that that machine was not dealing with noisy neighbors. And I guarantee you that when they did the cost benefit analysis of running cloud, versus running on hardware, no one budgeted for that time. That sort of caught them off guard. That's the sort of trade-off that you've got to think about ahead of time, that the efficiency you're gaining by using virtual machines, you're paying for that. For many of us, that cost is tiny compared to what you gain, but for other people, that might be worse. Um, the other thing, and, and this gets talked about a lot, is that when you're using utility-based billing, the, the structure of that pricing is set up to give you surprise cloud bills where it might be cheaper to operate at an extremely low scale to get something up and started and working for a very low price. But what you might find is that your revenue from that project as your, um, your user base grows and grows, you're actually finding that your cloud bill is growing at a faster rate than your regular bill. So sort of thinking out in advance about not just capacity planning, but financial planning, making sure that if you land that big deal you've been trying to land, that you're actually gonna make money on it with your current architecture, rather than feeding it all to a third-party cloud provider or for VMware for more licenses or, or however you choose to manage your virtual machines, even if they're local. Um, and one other thing with these is we were talking about data gravity. and. Uh, you know, at least when you're dealing with physical servers, you can take your Volkswagen and you can fill it full of SD cards or DVDs or whatever and, and, and physically move your data from one place to the other. You're not going to load a cloud into the back of your Passat. So data gravity becomes a very serious issue where you're not only maybe having to pay in time to get that migration done, you might actually be paying in money to get your data out due to the egress pricing that some of these have. There are even products that by design make it more expensive for you to extract your data than for you to put it in. And so data gravity is one of the major downsides to choosing a provider, because that means that once you pick that provider, you're looking at a material cost in money and time to get your data back out and rescue it and take it to maybe something that fits your workload better or can scale with your business. But uh, virtual machines are passe, right? Who uses virtual machines when you can use managed container engines, which are just, <laughs> just great. And, and this, is, this is the new abstraction layer. And, and again, I want to talk about lock-in with this a lot. If you've invested time in making your application Kubernetes native or making it run well on Docker Swarm or Amazon ECS, then, then you've locked yourself in with that technology. How many people have worked at a place that have deployed Kubernetes and you've got larger repos to hold your Helm charts than you do to actually hold the application you're running beneath them? And this is its own form of lock-in because you've spent time and money hiring, training people on how to use these technologies. So if you find that maybe there's something that doesn't quite fit, maybe an egg. And again, these things are great. Kubernetes has done great things. Managed container runtimes have done great things for our ability to deploy software and expect a consistent environment to do it in. But none of that comes free. And in fact, I think we've all ran into that one workload that just doesn't fit inside a container. 
but you, you can kind of make it fit. Just like, you know, you could probably fill a shipping container full of water if you really wanted to. But you've got to know in advance you're doing it. You've got to go and make that thing watertight. You've got to take the effort you need to make it fit. And that's the same sort of thing that, that you might find yourself or, ad, or other admins at your system doing. And that's an invisible cost that you might not see when you're deploying that. Um, and you know, some of those specific use cases I'm thinking about are when you have bespoke hardware, when you have a fancy GPU or AI card that you want to provision, you can't shift that around in the same way that you can shift around containers on any host. You might care about what specific hardware that workload is running on. Um, and I think we've all experienced some form of the problem of trying to run a traditional relational database on containers, especially before some of the tooling has gotten better as of recently for doing that. Um, and so this isn't to say it, it's bad by any means, but you've got to know your limitations up front. You've got to make sure that you're calculating in that cost of what you're paying in effort to make your infrastructure fit the environment it's running in um, ahead of time so you can think about it. But, uh, you know, it costs so much money to hire a system admin, to have operators, to have people thinking about cloud. And stuff. So why do we need servers at all? Let's just go serverless. Um, and, and this is where the, the, the lock-in orchestra reaches its crescendo. Because if a bank can fail, your cloud provider can fail. Your serverless provider can fail. And if you're building your environment on top of someone else's technology stack, and they go out of business, or maybe they can't scale up as large as you need them to, then is your, is your business, is your, is your project even going to have the expertise it needs to escape from that hole? Um, you know, we, and, uh, and this is kind of the secret with serverless, right? We talk about there's always hardware. They try to sell you on this idea that your servers are gone. This is not true, because the realities of hardware will still haunt you. You know, you don't, you don't have a ghost in your data center. It's just they're somewhere else. <laughs> so they'll still haunt you. They're not there. So we've sort of taken so far We've looked at this as like each layer you're trading off stuff, but almost no one actually runs an environment that's all of one thing or all of the other when they're going to move. So you sort of have to think and you have to mix and match some of the things you're working on. And the reality is you must mix and match the technologies you choose for your environment and for your needs. So for one example, you might have very specialized hardware, say radios in the back of servers inside, say, cell sites. And you might have telephone call packet processing systems that might be disjointed from that. And those might be in regional data centers. And they might be directly connected to other regional data centers for m the most efficient path of, of transport. And you may have disjointed call accounting systems. And you may have a customer-facing website on a completely different technology stack, which may be a static marketing website an application assets host on a cloud object store, or a web application with the required dependencies hosted in a Kubernetes stack, or just a simple status page on yet another provider, because you know it's good to kind of tell people when things aren't working. <laughs> and all of your web assets might be hosted in front of a, or, host, or front ended by a content delivery network. And what I've just described is basically your average telecom in the cellular marketplace. Well, physical telecom, not virtual telecom. There's a difference, unfortunately. <laughs> and technology is evolving. Popular abstractions have changed over time. We've gone from single host virtualization to API-based cloud computing and provisioning to manually manage containers on a single host to container orchestration systems. And as things continue to evolve, we're going to see new efforts, such as in the edge computing and hybrid cloud spaces, where people are being forced to look at things more holistically and evaluate. How are these things connecting? How are they being applied? Because in some cases, one solution might not fit across the board. You might just need this one piece over here and this other piece over here. 
And you're only going to be able to evaluate that and make that determination by looking at your stack and looking at the technology and making decisions based upon all your requirements and everything else. So this is more than just about business and trade-offs, right? It, it's about understanding what came before is going to help give you the future direction you're going to go. Um, you know, it, it makes you a better technologist to understand the things that's come before you and how they've influenced the designs of the things that were built on top of them. It, it can help us avoid repeating mistakes of the past when we consider some things, when we're, when we're thinking about new abstractions, whether maybe you're building one, maybe you've got the next great idea. I don't, so hopefully you do. <laughs> but you, know, you have to think about what functionality did I give up when I traded in this complex interface for something more simple? Because there's no magic, complexity is complexity. If you're taking a simple interface, the question you need to ask is, what are you giving up for that simplicity? And Sort of the follow-on to that is, is this new project or technology that I'm using or building, is it going to be similarly complex over time? Because maybe the reason it's simple is due to immaturity, due to the fact it's only covering, you know, maybe the 80% of use cases. And as it grows into um, rising the scope, doing more and more things, it's going to become similarly complex over time. And so you, you kind of have to ask yourself the question as to whether or not you actually gained anything by picking that simpler solution in the first place. Because you're having to involve, evolve the complexity of your interactions with that platform as it develops the complexity. And so it's important to remember that newer is not always better, better or easier. But sometimes it is. Again, we're talking about the downsides. The upsides are huge for cloud computing. And there are really some, some things that you're gonna have to consider when you're deciding how and what technology stacks you wanna use, you wanna combine, or you wanna build. So it's not just the technology. Ultimately, there are key factors you have to consider when making these decisions. Well, and it might be your business prefers operational expenses versus capital investment expenses. Can you afford the long-term implication of a capital investment? Can you pay the taxes every year? Do you want to deal with the accounting every year? And will doing the most efficient thing be too costly? These are all valid questions when you start looking at making business decisions. Another factor to consider is risk, which is very appropriate given what happened on Friday. <laughs> Do you trust the vendor technology to exist in the medium term? What would the cost be to pivot? To respond to a disaster? What happens when the thing you never thought would ever happen happens? And, you know, to kind of go to that point, I, working in legal services, we always just assumed if there would be a problem or if there was a... Uh, we wouldn't be able to get through all the documents in, or ta in time uh, that we could get a continuance from a judge. Whether it be convert all the images or s process all the text, we, we thought we would never have a problem getting a continuance until we did have a problem getting a continuance in court. And the judge said, you have 30 days. You have to be done in 30 days. And thus begin, or began the worst month of my life. <laughs> the most painful month of my life, where I was sleeping on the data center floor. <laughs> no one wants that. So when you look at the technical factors, you have to also think of what is your block I.O. latency? What type of I.O. are you doing? Whether you're working with just your memory or you're actually saying, I want you to commit this data to disk and bypass memory. There's an implication there, whether your process locks or not. Whether you're sending data over a, over a request to a remote system, what's the latency for that? Is it far away? Is it nearby? Will that system take a long time to process the request? Whether you have um, 
bandwidth or packet loss to consider, or even protocol overhead. Distance, you know, the speed of light is not necessarily the speed of light in fiber. <laughs> Same with waveforms in copper. It's about two-thirds. Then there's the technical impacts on policy. What if you have to run a separate application in front of your other application to do other things because security said so? And when will scaling become too cost prohibitive? Are there aspects that just can't scale in a cloud-like environment that you have to deal with? The conclusion, really, is that we're all more efficient now. There are multiple ways, and if you're willing, you can engineer your way out of most of these trade-offs that you're probably making already, or that you've already made. But you have to be conscious of the impacts and if you look at some of the prior examples of technology where people have engineered their way out of some of these issues, you, they, they've made very specific decisions to navigate these issues. Just don't forget what you're giving up. Make explicit choices about where to draw your line of abstraction. But up. Uh one of the thing that one of the things that's important and this is sort of getting to call to action of like stuff that that you can do about this you you might have to negotiate your business and your technical requirements there's a happy medium in there in there someplace that you have to find and that's a skill that you we have to learn yeah convincing a manager that maybe making the two year horizon decision over the quarterly horizon decision could save you a lot in the long run if the business is able to do that. But more importantly, and this is where I take it, learning about the lower layers is fun, right? Like if, if you're a technologist and you've not got your, your hands on an interesting piece of hardware yet, go find one. It's easier than ever today to get your hands on actual hardware, and actual hardware that looks like what runs in a data center. And, and and I personally find it inherently satisfying in a world where you work in virtual things, where, where you know, the output of your work is something you view on a monitor screen, to be able to go touch and feel something that you've done, to be able to have that connection to the place where the digital and the physical meet. So grab, grab an old machine off the shelf or, or ask a friend for one. You know, the old, old computers are everywhere. Toss in a fresh SSD, put some RAM in it, learn about the hardware on the platform, and, and try out a new Linux distribution. You know, maybe, maybe you've always been a Red Hat person and you're gonna try Gentoo or, or something like that to, to use that to, to engage with the hardware. Um, you know, maybe you hate your ISP provided router. You can assemble your own. You can go buy a, a machine at many hardware recyclers for 50 or $60 that works perfectly fine as a router. You can plug the network cards in it toss open sense on it, and you've learned something along the way while getting something done, and you get the satisfaction of knowing that, that you did it with that piece of hardware. Or, or maybe you're more of a maker. Maybe you're someone who, who likes putting that technical energy in the first place into producing physical things. Well, that's great. Get an Arduino and build yourself a homemade CNC using parts from the art store. Go, go grab a, a Raspberry Pi and go make something cool with it. And, and like this, this talk is, is really not all the knowledge you need, right? This is, this is an awareness talk. We're not here to teach you about every one of the trade-offs. We just want you to be aware and to explicitly think about where your platform starts, to not assume that it starts at a container, to not assume that it starts at a cloud, and instead to, to be deliberate about what you're doing. But this, this comes at a cost to some of us, because you can't learn everything playing around in your home lab. Um, many of the important trade-offs we've mentioned, you've noticed they're at super high scale. Our example is from a telco. So it, until you've had an opportunity to work at scale, and we're talking size, not conference, um, <laughs> you know, showing interest and having you know, that, that playful approach to learning and being hands-on is the start, but it's not enough. Those of us who have that knowledge, 
if you've lived through this, if you understand those trade-offs, if you've got a story like ours about where, where someone screwed up by not thinking about what could go wrong in advance, then you need to share it with people. And, and there are communities that exist to do that, to share that knowledge, to connect up people who've, who've seen the past, who help. I mean, Julie and I personally have worked on building one of these abstraction layers. It would make my day if you came and asked me about the trade-offs it would make. That would, be, that would be the best conversation I've had in a week. Not this week, but most weeks. <laughs> uh, so this means, you know, if you know it, you've got to share it. Uh, but, but more importantly, if you're starting out, if you, if you sat down on this talk and you said, you know, I, I don't know much about Harbor. This is not something that I've been involved with in the past. You've got to do something too. You've got to go pull that knowledge. You've got to go into those communities of people who are willing to share knowledge, share the stories and understanding. And coming to scale is a start because there are lots of people here with lots of interesting stories about things that they've done. But, you know, reach out. And, and I really do hope that, you know, maybe there's someone even in this room or, or on the other side of the recording who's watching this who might be the person who comes up with the next great abstraction. Um, I don't know, but if that's you, if you're thinking about that, if you have a great infrastructural idea, make sure you understand what's happened at each step before you and build that in to what you're doing. Build in an understanding of where you're going ahead of time so that people can use that knowledge and plan. And so, as, as we're sort of reaching our conclusion here, uh, I actually have a structural way to get that feedback. Um, twice a week, I hold a live stream on YouTube. You can go see it's uh, jay.jvf.cc slash office hours for a full schedule and uh, links to my YouTube page where, you know, think of it as like the professor in his office at a, cl at a class you might have attended. Come in ask some questions, maybe just watch silently and see like how the actual work of open source is done because we're figuring it out too, right? We're all trying to, to figure out where we're going. Um, and you know, if, if you wanna find me, I'm J-A-Y-F on OFTC or libera.chat, which are both accessible via IRC and Matrix. Um, I strongly suggest if you're not involved in any um, traditional tech-based communities and you're a person who wants to get this knowledge, go get an account on Matrix and, and join some of the chat channels on OFTC and libera.chat. We've, uh, many communities have gone through a lot of work to try to lower that barrier of entry to make it easier. Um, also, if you want a job, come find me. My employer's hiring, happy to hire you. I can also be found in OFTC, IRC, and Matrix, and I have email addresses. So, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, are, there, are there any questions? If you have questions, put your hand up and I'll go give you a microphone. All right. I can do the running if you want. Oh, this is what I've been looking forward to the whole talk. Yeah, we'll do it. Yeah, we'll do it. Yeah, this is what I've been looking forward to the whole talk. Hello. Give us your name and your question. Uh, Catherine Tang. Um, thanks for this talk. Really appreciate some of the just discussion and insight. Um, you had a, de a slide around technical considerations where you talked about sometimes scaling might be prohibitive, or sometimes um, there are, I guess, limits to what you can scale on, on cloud. Can you give some examples as to like, what kind of scaling limits you're talking about? So I have a really concrete example of that that I was thinking of when I wrote that slide, and I'm sure Julia has a story as well. But in, in my case, I'm thinking about a, an environment I worked in once that extensively used RDS. And I was there the day we looked and we saw that our disk space had risen to the point where we had to grow the RDS, and the panic that came across people's faces is we realized we had reached the highest tier of storage for RDS. And we essentially had a timer and a graph on how quickly we could build a sharding into our application in order to avoid hitting that hard scaling wall. And I mean, that's a specific example, but I think those things exist everywhere. Do you have, a, do you have another example? The example that comes to mind for me is um, I was running a database platform ages ago, and this database was built along, uh, built along with context and ideas that date back to VAC systems. And so this was not a cloud database, but we were married to the database and the technology. And it took 
the development team years of effort to basically rewrite an entirely new database API and abstraction layer because we could not evolve. We just couldn't scale our way out of that problem. We, it was architectural in nature and it wasn't even code we wrote. It was code that was written years and years ago that we leveraged and there was just no, no scaling that could be done there. It was quite literally a whole new technology had to be developed. Yeah, and there's some value in, like, both of our examples are cloud-related, but, you know, this is a talk about hardware, and there are a lot of problems that you, you can't solve in cloud or that cloud might be a slow follower to, such as, you know, GPUs were used in computing for a long time to do real work before you could do, use them in the cloud. And so that's another case where, you know, if you're using the cloud, you might not necessarily consider specialized hardware, but there are definitely some cases where that specialized hardware can get you out of a jam. And one thing to keep in mind is we're now seeing more and more cases where people are putting, say, Linux inside of machines, inside of machines, where you're basically nesting the entire relationship. So at some point, you can't necessarily see all the way in through those boxes, and that's not cloud, but you might need the application running three layers in to actually work properly. Yeah, I mean, we're actually, we're actually talking about this in, in OpenStack right now as support for, um, for these very advanced network cards, which more or less are a computer that pass network data to your thing. And it's, it's crazy what some of the specialized hardware can do. And believe me, they wouldn't be making it if there weren't use cases for, for what it's good. So those are, thanks for giving us the chance to tell those stories. That's all fun. Is there any other questions? Just say your name and ask your question. Uh, yeah, my name's Spet. I want to ask, uh, you mentioned getting old hardware earlier and going to like a recycling center. But like whenever I call one, they say that they're destroying their stuff instead of selling it. So do you have any like examples of where to go? Oh, see, I'm a little spoiled. I literally have 10 minutes from my house is a PC recycler which takes uh, computers that are that are salvageable and and sells them and you know you can revamp it but honestly I'm an old computer enthusiast and you don't need new computers to do this stuff like even something Vista era um, in fact older might be better because that means you're more likely to be able to go on eBay and get cheap RAM or cheap things on it because part of the point is to play with the hardware right so I'm gonna tell you as an old computer enthusiast, I love going to yard sales. You can find the craziest stuff at yard sales for dirt cheap. I probably have two or three um, early Intel um, core type CPUs that I got for like, well, not CPUs, but the whole, whole kit and caboodle, the, uh, the, the desktops for, for about 20 bucks. So like, I, I don't know necessarily for the Bay Area, I know weird stuff used to be a thing, but I don't think they're around, no, that's Northern California. See, I'm, I'm out of my element here. I'm Washington, Northern California, not, not so much for the SoCal. But they, they definitely exist in most places, if you're having trouble finding them, maybe switch to like Facebook Marketplace, you know, uh, Craigslist, that, that more like person to person rather than trying to get the corporate off lease stuff. I've tended to, to actually go to eBay directly and uh, if you look very carefully, you can find vendors that have old stock that has been sitting in warehouses sometimes. I mean, if. I, don't, I, don't, I know this is, if I'm telling, you know, like uh, someone who's getting started, you know, here, spend all this money. But uh, I've even found success going on AliExpress or Alibaba and getting some of, they have uh, machines that are completely passively cooled that you can get that has like an older Intel laptop chip in it. I think I paid 120 or 30 bucks shipped for one that had four, two and a half gig NICs to do the exact router replacement that I advocated you could do for fun. All right, I'm going to. Another question back here. This is in relation to the question which is this is in relation to the question which was asked just now. I believe in the Bay Area, Anchor Electronics took on the weird stuff warehouse stock, and also there's Unix surplus as well. Yeah, I would actually strongly suggest there's a lot. Uh, this is this is a. There's a lot of local presenters in the exhibition hall. I think that's still gonna be open tomorrow. That's actually probably one of the best resources. Go to like, I saw 
Um, there was like Linux Chick LA, there was, uh, there was a couple of security groups, like they're gonna have a better plug into the local area here in Southern California than I do, and maybe they can give you specific tips. I'll also say, this is the perfect targeted question to hit me up on a social or at one of my office hours about, because I will, I will shop and talk with you about fancy crazy hardware forever. Don't get me started again on the really cool AV thing under here, which uh, they're lucky I didn't check a bag or else it might be going home with me. Is there any other questions? No, don't worry. Hold on, I'm, no, I'm gonna give you the microphone. We gotta make sure it's recorded for all the, for all the folks online. Yeah, uh, just a suggestion, Goodwill uh, has computer stores around. Um, and then, I, at least I know my local university also has a, a used computer store, well, so, university. Using, uh, university of Pittsburgh, so. Okay, great. So if you're watching this on the internet and you're from Pittsburgh, go get some really cool university computers. University computers can sometimes be some of the most interesting, too. Uh, what, what's our time here? Um, Is there any further questions, or? Hey, we really appreciate y'all coming and listening to this. Uh, if there's ever anything we can help you with, with uh, using any of our abstraction layers, please do reach out. Uh, you know, Ironic's pretty great for provisioning bare metal. Please use it. Just understand what you're giving up when you pick our software to use. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day.